we looked at the monk Guinillo's criticism of the ontological argument as, as Anselm presented it, right? Um, he, what he did was use a technique called reputation by logical analogy and Guinillo tried to say, well, wait a second, you're talking about God as that in which none greater can be thought, Anselm, the greatest being we can conceive. Well, what if we talk of, talked about the greatest island we can conceive, you know, an island than which no greater island can be thought? And we saw that Guinillo said, well, you know, couldn't I use the same reasoning you're using in the ontological argument, Anselm, to, um, to show that I, that island must exist, that somehow it must be out there? And wouldn't it seem odd that we could prove by mere thought that that island is out there somewhere, you know? And, and of course, the reason that's a criticism is what? Because if it's a parallel argument and, 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 and it seems wrong to be able to prove the existence of the most perfect island just by using that reasoning, uh, you know, Guinilla was saying it, it must be wrong also to use that kind of reasoning to, to prove God. And one of the things that, that, you know, as I recall Anselm said in response is, is that the two cases are different, that trying to talk about the greatest with respect to some created thing like an island isn't the same as talking about a being that is the greatest in an unqualified sense the way God is. Um, but also things here are not perfect whereas God is perfect. So Descartes, a few hundred years later, um, wants to get out of skepticism. We're, we're going to look at Descartes' views on that later on when we look at um, the theory of knowledge in modern philosophy, but, but Descartes needs an abstract argument to prove God. And one of the abstract arguments he uses is the ontological argument, uh, but he tweaks it in, in ways that seem to get around some of the criticisms that that um, Guinillo leveled against it. So both versions of this claim that we can prove the existence of God from mere thought. We don't have to look around at the world and how things cause other things and the things are, that a cause is necessary for stuff to happen like the cosmological argument does, or, or look around for evidence of, evidences of design and the fact that some things are created or seem to serve purposes and need to be fashioned, made to serve those purposes. Now this again says we can prove God's existence by mere thought. So we saw that St. Anselm works with the concept of God as the greatest being imaginable. Um, Descartes, his concept of God is more in line with the way theologians talk about God as having uh, certain characteristics. And, and again, we're, we're talking about Proving God essentially as God is thought of in a monotheistic context. Um, these kinds of arguments don't work to prove the existence of Thor or Zeus, but they might to prove uh, the God of uh, the Judeo-Christian and I guess Islamic tradition. 
So Descartes works with the concept of God as the most perfect being, the supremely perfect being. The way it was talked about in the 20th century is God is the sum of all perfect qualities, of all perfections. Um, so, and here's what Descartes is going to try to convince us of. Think of a triangle. Um, Aristotle thought that, that there were qualities that were essential to a thing and other qualities he thought were accidental. Um, in other words, it's, it's not essential to a triangle that it be called, colored, uh, I guess that's red, red or yellow or, or black or any other color, right? I mean, that has nothing to do with whether or not the figure in, in the slide's a triangle. But it is essential to a triangle that it have three sides and three angles that add up to 180 degrees. And we saw that Aristotle thought that there were certain essential qualities that things have and that even human beings fit into this category. We saw in his ethics, he thought of us as essentially rational, reasoning beings, that that's what's different uh, what separates us from other plants and other animals uh, that exist but uh, so if if having three sides and three angles are essential to what a triangle is what Descartes is going to try to convince us of is that existence and here he really means necessary existence, is a, an essential part of who God is. That is, um, it is so much of an essential part of who God is that you can't separate existence from who God is any more than you can separate having three sides and three angles from what a triangle is. Or another way of saying it is that um, existence is essential to the concept, uh, you know, and to the description of God. So you can see where he's going with this, right? If existence, even necessary existence, is part of God's essence, then you can't talk about God except uh, as an existing being. So for Descartes, we can't even think of God except as existing any more than we could think of a triangle that does not have three sides and three angles. So he's saying that existence is so necessary to who and what God is that it would be like, you know, talking about God as not existing would be like talking about a triangle that doesn't have three angles. Uh, you ain't going to do it, right? Uh, there's a, a logical, um, you know, problem with, with doing it. So... So how does he get to this claim? What supports this claim? Well, what supports it? I, I, I got to get to building and maintenance and say, guys, can you come over here with a can of WD-40, you know, and spray the hinges or, or some three-in-one oil or something? Do you ever notice that? That, I mean, these hinges creak like you know, like the hinges on a, an old pirate ship in the movies. Anyway, back to this. Okay, so why is, is God's existence so supposed, or is existence supposed to be such a, an important part of who God is for Descartes? 
Well, it, it's bound up with this claim that God is the most perfect being, the supremely perfect being. And, and here, again, we have a platonic assumption sneaked in here. And, and that is that somehow greatness and existence go hand in hand. That something can't be greater without also existing to more full degree. And, and also, remember for Plato you had the form of the good that for him was the most fully existing thing around. Everything else fell short of the form of the good. So Plato put goodness, not God, at the top of the heap. Later, St. Augustine tried to reconcile Plato's views with traditional Roman Catholic Christianity by saying, well, Plato's forms exist, but they're in the mind of God. They're not out there in some separate world. You know, so... Um, at any rate, if we think of God as a supremely perfect being, and if if existing has some something to do with perfection, that something that fully exists is more perfect than something that doesn't. For Plato, you'll recall that to be less than good is to be less than real. In other words, other things fell short of the form of the good, but they also fell short in reality. Um, you know, again, a reminder that I don't need to remind you of, existence for us is an all or nothing thing, pretty much, isn't it? I mean, something either exists or it doesn't, but there's no halfway, there's no degrees of existence. What we saw for Plato, there is. Um, there, there's like continuous degrees of existence from the form of the good on down. So, rolling, rolling along here. Suppose we describe God and God's properties. And here, he comes up with a definition of God that if, if you open some book in theology, you're, you're going to get a list of the traditional attributes of God. That's pretty much what Descartes gives us here. You know, so he... Um, and he says, well, God has perfect qualities like omnipotence. And anybody rec recall what omnipotence means? Ever present. Pardon? Ever present. Uh, well, a actually, uh, you, you're, you got one of them, but, but that's the third one, omnipresence. Oh. But po potent, if something's potent, we say this is a, a potent drug, a potent medicine. What do we mean? It's powerful, right? So if God is omnipotent, God is all-powerful. Um, and omniscient, pardon? Very good. Oh, no, yeah. You were, you were awake in Sunday school that morning or wherever, wherever you learned it from. Yeah, yeah, omniscience means God, God knows everything, right? Um, and again, omnipresence is the one you, you were searching for, um, that, that God is everywhere. It's not that God gets around so fast in the universe, but more or less that the universe is in God, not the other way around. And omnibenevolence... Um, it, it, it incorporates things like God's mercy, but also God's um, uh, moral perfection. Okay? So, now, note what I say above this. The, if, if you were going to list God's perfect properties for Descartes, 
the left description would fail as a complete description of the supremely perfect being. Why? Because it leaves out a very important quality, which the list on the right puts in. And that would be existence. In other words, to these other traditional qualities, Descartes says we, we also have to add uh, existence as one of God's perfections. Now, suppose you do this. In other words, suppose you say that what's on the right here is what we mean by the supremely perfect being. What would happen or could you say, well, okay, I would accept that if God is around, God would be the supremely perfect being. That is, if the God of, of the Bible, church tradition, traditional theism were around, God would be the supremely perfect being. But then you went on to say, but I don't believe God exists. Well, what have you done here? You said part of the concept of God being the supremely perfect being is that God possesses existence as a quality. And here we really mean necessary existence, that God existed from all eternity. Uh, so what would happen, let's put it this way, could you say, well, I, I believe if God were around, God would be the most, the supremely perfect being, but I don't believe God exists. Note how you've subtly contradicted yourself, right? Because in buying into the concept of God as the supremely perfect being, it, it, if part of the meaning of that concept is in order to be the supremely perfect being you have to exist, you'd then be contradicting yourself if you said, but I don't think the, superm the God as the supremely perfect being exists. So, so how would this, you know, so, so the point is, as I put it here, so completely does God the supremely perfect being exist that God can't even be thought of as not existing, you know, because existence is somehow part of the concept of God as a supremely perfect being. So here, if we go back to the full, and again, if you weren't here when we went over the last one, he's not trying to call people who doubt God's existence fools, but he's quoting a biblical verse that's from the Psalms. It says, um, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So the fool here would contradict himself to, on the one hand, buy into the notion of God as a supremely perfect being, and on the other hand, claim that that God does not exist. So um, this is the way one textbook I used to use uh, summarized, and I really should put it down. God has all perfections. That is all perfect qualities. Existence is a perfection. Therefore, God possesses existence as a quality or simply, therefore, God exists. Um, so, you, you can see uh, on this one, if you buy into the concept of God as the supremely perfect being, um, if Descartes right, you've also bought into the concept of God's existence. Now, as I said last time, you have to separate out two things. 
it, it's one thing to believe or not believe in God, okay? It's another thing entirely to think that a particular argument that somebody says proves God really does the job. In other words, you can reject the argument without rejecting belief in God. And this was what Immanuel Kant did. Immanuel Kant was in a kind of German Lutheran tradition, even though he was um, one of the best philosophers of his time, Kant believed in God. In fact, he, he thought that um, we're rationally justified if, 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 if life down here is to make any sense at all. And if moral right and wrong is to make any sense at all, Kant thought that it's obvious that justice is not done in this world, that the good are not always rewarded in this world, in this life, and that evil is not always punished. People get away with stuff. But Kant thought in order for it all to make sense, we as philosophers are rationally entitled to conclude the existence of an afterlife and the existence of a God who is going to bring about justice in the afterlife. That is, who will ultimately see that righteousness is rewarded and evil is, is punished. Um, well, that was Kant's view. So Kant believed in God and, and he even thought that, um, that belief in God was necessary to think that life is, makes any sense down here. Because it's, now, now, existentialists like Sartre deny that and they deny God and they think that life is just simply absurd. Righteousness is not always rewarded. You know, evil not always punished. But at any rate, let, let me go back to this. Um, Kant was a very good logician as well as a philosopher. And Kant in the 1900s, um, I, I'm sorry, in the um, 18th century, gives us Uh, uh, responded uh, give, gives us a reason why he thinks Descartes' argument does not work. And it all has to do with how Descartes handles existence. Um, what Kant is going to try to show is that existence is not just another property of a thing. I mean, I, I, I went without a car for a year and a half, but I now have one, right? And so, uh, if somebody said, well, you know, describe your car, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find it in the parking lot. Well, you know, if I said, well, okay, it's a uh, 2007 seven Mini, it's green, it has two doors, it exists, it has a standard transmission, uh, black top. They say, whoa, 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 wait, back up for a second, Murawski. You say it has a standard transmission, two doors, and it exists. How, how, how is it that you're including existence in there? This is Kant's point. Kant's point is that Descartes includes existence as a property of God, but that when we describe anything, it has to exist in order to have any properties, right? My car has to exist out there in the stupid parking lot in order to be green, have a standard transmission, have a black top, or any of the other qualities it has. 
If it didn't exist, it wouldn't have any of those qualities. But, and here's, here's the important point, existence is not just another property of my car, like having a standard transmission and being green is, or, or properties. Um, but existence or non-existence, says Kant, is a precondition for things having any qualities. But existence is not a quality itself. Now, now this is one reason why we go over these arguments is th these are some of the more complex ones we're going to look at in Intro to Philosophy. Um, and it's good to try to struggle with understanding uh, a difficult argument and, and response like this. So, so basically Descartes' version of the ontological argument has existence functioning as just another one of God's qualities. Uh, we call this a, as a logical predicate. In other words, if I, um, if, if I say this desk chair is blue, I predicate that property of the desk chair. That is, uh, I say that the desk chair has the property of being blue in color. You know, if, if I say that it has uh, metal legs, then I predicate that property of the desk chair. That's what we mean by a logical predicate. And so we can predicate of God that God is omniscient, or as he said, omnipresent, um, and Descartes says, well, we can also predicate of God that God exists. But Kant says, no. Existence is not a logical predicate. It's not just another property a thing has. But something has to exist in order to have any properties at all. So you say, well, why does that make this abstract logical point a criticism of Descartes' um, version of the argument? Well, it goes back to Descartes including existence in the list of God's qualities. The, the point is, Immanuel Kant says <coughs> existence should not be treated as just another quality of a thing, but as we said, as a precondition something has to fulfill in order to have any qualities. That is, my car has to fulfill the precondition of existing before it can be green or have any other properties. So I, I kind of make that point in this slide. So car has to exist in order to have any qualities, but existence isn't just another property the car has, along with, say, having the property of being red or, or having a standard transmission. So Kant says we describe something that we're talking about with all of its properties but then we talk about whether it exists or doesn't exist. So how does this relate? So Kant says, look, if we deny existence to something, note, we, we had that slide that had the red sports car in it. If I say there's no red sports car pictured in this slide, I deny existence to the sports car. And note, I'm rejecting the sports car and every single property it was claimed to have. And this is what Kant says. Um, if existence is not a list of God's properties, we do not contradict ourselves by describing God and then as the unbeliever would say, denying God's existence. 
In other words, Kant thought that you could deny the existence of God, even though he personally believed in God, that you could deny the existence of God without contradicting yourself. But for Descartes, that's not going to happen. So go back to the triangle. Um, remember, Descartes tried to say that separating existence from God would be like separating having three angles and three sides from a triangle. But Kant says, look, yes, if we think of a triangle, it necessarily has to have three sides and three angles to be a triangle. Right? If we think of a triangle, we have to think of it as having three angles and three sides. But, Kant says, if I deny the existence of the triangle, I'm rejecting the whole thing, sides and angles and all. So, but if we deny existence of the triangle, then we reject it completely with all its sides and angles. Um, so he says the way this applies to God is we can describe God with all of God's qualities, but unlike what Descartes says, existence is not one of those qualities. Then Kant says afterwards we can talk about whether the God we just described exists or does not exist. Without con and we can deny existence to God without contradicting ourselves because existence is no longer a list of God's properties. Putting it in the list of God's properties is what made it a contradiction to both claim God as the supremely perfect being and then deny God's existence because existence, you've already built it into the list. Kant says, no, it's not in the list as a property. That's not the way existence functions. And for logic from the 19th century, uh, 1900s on, th this is the way existence is treated even to this day in formal logic. Now, um, and, and so uh, for years people thought that Kant dealt the death blow to this argument. Now, obviously, not everybody accepted what Kant had to say. But um, I'm just going to, instead of writing it on the board, let's see. Maybe I can. No, I don't have any markers. Nobody's left me any. Uh, basically, in the 20th century, there was an argument that was reformulated, a version of this that was reformulated that talks about um, God and, and basically it says that if it's possible that there is a necessary being uh, here the argument talks about God having a necessary existence in every possible world, in every conceivable interpretation. Uh, just to describe it in real quick terms, the argument goes from the assumption that if it's possible for a necessary being to exist, it proves as a conclusion that it's necessary that a necessary being exists. In other words, somebody who denies God might say, well, I, I deny that a necessary being exists, i.e. God, as that necessary being. But they might say, well, I'll grant you that it's at least possible a necessary being exists. But the modern proof says if it's possible a necessary being exists, then it's necessary that a necessary being exists. That is, that there's no way you can deny God's existence. And that formulation treated existence the way Kant and modern logic treats it.